Hello there. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, in the late 19th century, uh, Tolstoy was walking across the landscape on a very hot day, and he saw a madman in the distance going like this. And he thought, why is it that people are allowed to uh, leave mad people out there on the, in the hot day? Why don't the local village look after him? So anyway, they got nearer. And the man was doing that. And he got nearer and nearer. And every time he thought, isn't it terrible that there's nowhere in Mother Russia to help people like this? And then he got very close. And the man was sharpening a scythe. That's the real problem around poverty. That is the real problem about the gap between rich and poor and the illusory gap between rich and poor. So here I am talking about the illusory gap between rich and poor, and I'm now using slides for the first time. So if I screw it up, please forgive me. Come on, then. Where's the next one? Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is a very interesting slide. I'm just going to throw up some slides to show you about the illusory gap that exists around poverty. 32% of all income that is brought into the, by the Treasury, that's not the money that they borrow. Um, last year or the year before, the Treasury uh, received about 500 and 50 billion pounds from the public and borrowed about another 150 billion. A third of that money, almost a third of that money, went to poor people. But it didn't go to poor people in order to get poor people out of poverty. It went to poor people to enable them to stay poor. The vast amount of that money went into Social Security. Now, social security is wrongly named. It should be social insecurity, because when you go into social security, it is a, a kind of safety net that's made of concrete. So what happens is that you're in life, and something goes wrong, and then you, uh, you fall into a problem, and boom, you get down, and you hit that safety net, and it's made of concrete, and you stay down. That is why under one half of one percent, sorry, un yeah, under one half of, under one percent of people from a social security background will end up doing um, higher education. Now, we're very, very happy in the United Kingdom because the figure used to be that the working class was five percent of the, of the population of uh, universities, and then it grew to about 15 to 17 percent under the offices of people like Blair and under the offices of people like Brown. That's great. But hidden within that working class, that was a class of people who were working. But lo and behold, left behind was in the region of four to five million people who were on social security and were not filling up our colleges and our universities. They were filling up our prisons. 85% of the population of people in prison come from a social security background. Not my figures, the figures of the Home Office. So this figure is an enormous amount of money. So if you take the gap between rich and poor, you have to close it down a bit when you realize that people like me, who when they were young and screwing around and being naughty boys, had thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds spent on them, much more than that was spent on uh, some of the wealthiest people in Britain, was spent trying to sort out the fact that I needed to go to prison and I needed to be reformed. So you've got this kind of weird world that we don't understand, and that is that we spend money on crime, and crime and poverty go together, and we spend money on poverty that doesn't actually get people out of poverty. So a lot of this 32% is simply a Band-Aid. It's simply pasting over the problem as the last speaker was talking about. Right. 
I went to see Mr. Cameron when he, before he became a, the leader of the Conservative Party. And I said to him, I wonder how much it costs to produce a posh chap like you to run your posh party. Uh, and he said, oh, I said, I reckon about a third of a million pounds. And he said, well, actually, the family had done how much it cost to, uh, to, produce, a, uh, to produce somebody like Mr. Cameron. And they worked it out at about a quarter of a million pounds. And I said, God, you're cheap. <laughs> God, you're cheap. Do you know, one big issue vendor is worth four of you. Because the average cost of producing a big issue vendor is one million pounds. How does that work out? We did a survey just before I went to see Mr. Brown. Uh, sorry, Mr. Cameron. Oh, they're all interchangeable, by the way, so don't worry. <laughs> They really are, and I hope you lot wise up. Because <laughs> don't wait for me to wise up. <laughs> anyway, and I said, we'd done this survey. I said, this survey proved that 87% of the people who were selling the big issue one weekend in London, 87% of them came from a social security background at some stage. But they came from broken families and 87% of them had been in local authority care. Now, I don't know if you know how much local authority care costs, but I assure you, it costs an enormous amount of money, two or three thousand pounds a week. So if you've got somebody who's in the system for a year, for, sorry, for 10 years, and the average person is, that's where you get your million pounds from. There was a sex ring broken recently in, uh, in Rochdale, which I wrote about in the Times because I was so disgusted by the way it was handled. Because there was a business, 3i, I don't know if you know 3i, a wonderful company, they owned uh, uh, um, hostels or they owned children's homes where there was one customer for these little houses, the house in a back street in Rochdale, one customer, that was one person, and they charged the state £250,000 a year to look after this little girl. And this little girl was being sex trafficked at the same time. That is the reality. There is a shed load of money to be made out of poverty. And that's, uh, that's our figure. Anyway, all right, where's the next one? Oh, yeah, here we go. I, what I'm trying to do by telling you the Tolstoy story, is say we have to get close. We have to get really close to understand poverty. We have to get really close to understand the gap between rich and poor. Because what we're doing is we're practicing the old age, old Judeo-Christian thing, which is go out and find the baddies. And go out and capture the goodies. Unfortunately, there don't, be, don't seem to be enough goodies around at the moment. So we're in this, we're always moralizing. We always want to know who's the bad guy. And that's great, that's great. But the problem is it doesn't change anything. It changes nothing at all. The, these are not my figures, unfortunately, so if they're all crap, blame somebody else. <laughs> but the combined wealth of all the wealthiest in the world that occur in those big books produced by the Sunday Times is about three, three trillion pounds. Now, if you consider that the, that is equal to the amount of all the houses and property in the UK, you can see that it's an enormous amount of money. But this figure here dwarfs that figure. And that figure is all of the pensions that are largely given out in the advanced capitalist countries. And it's your pension, it's your mum's pension, it's your dad's pension, and it's the pension that you hope to get when you're uh, my age. I'm, unfortunately, I haven't got a pension, so I've got to keep bloody well working. <laughs> anyway, that is an enormous amount of money. That money goes to people like Goldman Sachs, who then have to turn a billion pounds or five billion or a hundred billion into something else. They have to keep pushing the price up. That is the power of us. 
That's your power. That's my power. Or we're not mine, as I told you, but your power. And what I'm suggesting is that what we need to be doing is we need to be moving very, very close to the problem, understanding the problem, so that we can change the problem. Since I was a young man and started stop nicking and doing all sorts of stuff like that, I used to be a thief, and now I'm a, I'm a social entrepreneur. A part of the problem. <laughs> I was a part of the problem, and now I'm a part of the solution. But since then, I have been contributing every day of my life, in some way or other, to widening that gap between rich and poor. Why have I been doing that? Or how have I been doing that? I've been buying my Apple computers and making people richer. I've been buying my Amazon bloody Kindle and making somebody else richer. And all of you are creating that gap. You're widening the gap between rich and poor because you're giving money to people like Tesco's and Walmart and all these big companies. So we are the persons, we are the dynamic behind the social gap that's gathering between rich and poor. My argument is very, very simple. We need to, uh, where's the, sorry, the next slide, yes. We have the power and we need to use the power. We need to use the power to dismantle poverty and that cannot simply be done by people occupying and people protesting. We have to get in and get dirty and we have to start doing really profound and interesting things. Over last Christmas, a bunch of one percenters got a good kick in the nuts. <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> but I can still do it. Uh, sorry, I lost my teeth, I can't. I can't bite people anymore. Not like in the good old days. But the point is, over Christmas, all these one percenters lost something. And what they lost was the fact that five billion pounds of footfall was removed from Tesco's. Now, there must have been some reason to do with the occupiers. And raising the, the occupying movement is a wonderful movement because it raises people's comprehension of what's going on in the world. But five billion pounds was knocked off the, <coughs> off the value of their shops in that air, in that air, and the sales, sorry, the, the uh, what do you call it, the share prices fell by 18%. What a wonderful reality that was made by people like you and me, because we said, sod it, we're not going to go to Tesco's. What I'm saying is we have an enormous opportunity now in these failing times to try and get some value, to be knocking the government around to be knocking the local authorities around, to be knocking everybody around about the enormous waste that we're, wa that we're spending on social security because it does not bring opportunity for the poor. And at the same time, we have an enormous opportunity to band together and to become powerful people through what we buy. Because by buying, what we choose to buy, in a sense, is what we choose to vote. Because buying and voting are the same bloody thing. And I am advocating here and now that you all join the great John Bird movement. And the great John Bird movement is a very, very simple thing, and that is you become conscious shoppers. You become conscious users of that power because that is the power that could bring about social change in this world in, in an enormous way. It's not just about fair trade, though fair trade is a wonderful invention and I've been very involved in that for the last 20 years. But it's about using your money and using your opportunity and banding together to really say, sorry, we don't want to buy Apple anymore. We're going to go somewhere else. Sorry, we're not going to go to Walmart and Tesco. We're going to go somewhere else. And we can start demonstrating the power that we have. It's the power, the collective power. Now, as an ex-Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyist, sorry, I forgot, I forgot Engels, so as a, as a Meltist, uh, Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Trotsky, as an ex-one of them, I know that there's always been this idea of collectivism. And the communist movement has always gone on about let's have collective power. Unfortunately, it's the middle class telling what the working class and the underclass to do. 
This has to be different. This has to be a collectivism that involves us all, whatever class. And it has to involve the poor, and it has to involve the people who are not poor. It has to involve every single re level of society. Thank you very much, and God bless you.